Dwarf mistletoe is one of the most damaging of all the diseases or insects in the forest. It is a parasite which feeds and grows on living trees. On western hemlock and lodgepole pine, dwarf mistletoe destroyed a volume equal to about a quarter of the annual cut of these species and causes a greater economic loss to our forests than all the other forest pests combined. The good news? Dwarf mistletoe is more easily controlled than any other disease. It spreads slowly and is restricted to a limited number of tree species. As it depends on living trees for survival, its spread can be controlled once the host is killed. Therefore, through good forestry management, losses can be greatly reduced. We eventually hope to see the reduction of dwarf mistletoe to the point where it no longer causes significant forest damage. The four major hosts for dwarf mistletoe are lodgepole pine, hemlock, larch, and Douglas fir. Other trees can be affected, but usually in a minor way. Western red cedar, yellow cedar, western yew, and juniper appear to be immune. The disease in lodgepole pine is widely distributed throughout the province. In hemlock, it occurs in the coastal forest stands, while stands in the interior wet belt are free from infection. Larch mistletoe occurs only in southeastern British Columbia. In Douglas fir, the least affected of the principal hosts, the concentration is mainly in the Okanagan and Similkameen valleys. Douglas fir in the coastal forests remain free of the disease. Dwarf mistletoe has an inner root system by which it absorbs and transfers food substances obtained from the host tree. Its outer reproductive system is made up of slender, leafless aerial shoots. Dwarf mistletoe has both male and female plants. Flowers of the male have petal-like parts which open, exposing pollen sacs, while the female flowers remain closed. Both types of flowers produce nectar which attracts insects and which in turn pollinate the female flower. Following fertilization, the female plant produces green to dark brown berries. When the berries are mature, seeds are forcibly ejected from them. Internal water pressure provides the driving force that sends the seeds up to 15 meters away. When released, the initial speed of the seeds can be as high as 80 kilometers per hour. The seeds are covered with a sticky, viscous pulp which enables them to adhere to the foliage or less commonly to twigs and branches. In the first rain, the pulp absorbs water and becomes very slippery. Depending upon the angle of the needle, the seeds will slide towards the twig or drop to the ground. Once on the twigs, the seeds glue themselves tightly to the surface of the bark. This one has germinated and developed its long radical or root by which it feeds and grows. Holdfasts are developed at the end of these root-like structures and the seed now begins penetration of the trees through these holdfasts. This is followed by the development of a system of strands and sinkers shown here in red. Now the dwarf mistletoe really begins its destruction. The cortical strands grow up and down the twig. The sinkers drive down into the cambium, and as the tree grows, the sinkers are embedded by successive layers of wood rings. This slide shows an infection of a 40-year-old lodgepole pine. As the number and size of the host cells multiply, swelling begins. This is the first sign of infection although the most visible indications are the aerial shoots, which do not usually emerge until the second or third year. The shoots of the Douglas fir mistletoe are only about two centimeters long, whereas the shoots of the other mistletoes may be up to ten centimeters long. Lodgepole pine mistletoe can be distinguished from the other three types 
as it produces branches in a whorled fashion. The other three branch in a fan-like fashion. These branching patterns help in identifying the species when they occur together. The life cycle of the dwarf mistletoe averages five years and develops as follows. During the first year, seeds are ejected and intercepted by foliage. Rains cause the seeds to slide down and adhere to the twigs. Later on, they germinate, form holdfasts, and then begin penetration of the host. There are no indications yet that the tree has been infected. In the second year, swelling of bark and wood begins, causing distortion of the annual rings. Aerial shoots appear during the third year and stem and branch swellings enlarge. Emergence of the flower, pollination and fertilization all occur in the fourth year. In the fifth year, the fruit matures and seeds are dispersed over a wide area. Infected trees can be recognized by definite symptoms the most conspicuous being a proliferation of branches called witch's brooms. Seen here are pendulous witch's brooms in lodgepole pine and spherical witch's brooms on western larch. These are palm-shaped witch's brooms on western hemlock. These brooms reach large sizes with age. There are also spindle-shaped swellings on branches and stems similar for all types of mistletoes. On hemlock, shown here, and less commonly on larch, stem infections develop into very large swellings. Dwarf mistletoe causes major damage to our forests. It can retard their growth and affect wood quality. Here are some examples. In five lodgepole pine stands, ranging from 37 to 117 years in age, growth losses were 18 to 32 percent. A 100-year-old stand, affected for 70 years, averaged only three cunits, compared with 24 cunits in healthy stands. In a mature western hemlock stand, it was estimated the growth loss was 40 percent. Infected trees were 4.3 meters shorter than control trees of the same diameter. Dead tissue produced by dwarf mistletoe allows stain and decay fungi to enter the tree, causing even greater damage. From a single infected tree, mistletoe spreads slowly, although in 15 years the disease will cover a radius of nearly 22 meters. Over an 80-year period, the disease will expand to a radius of 45 meters, destroying many of the trees in the immediate vicinity. While dwarf mistletoe is widespread and causes considerable losses of both quality and quantity of wood in British Columbia, it can be controlled. The most effective approach is to take preventative measures either during or shortly after clear-cut logging or after a wildfire. The disease can invade the regeneration from infected bordering stands or residual trees left after logging. Spread of the disease can be controlled by felling the residuals or infected trees in the adjacent areas. As well, natural or man-made barriers can be employed or resistant species can be planted along the margin to prevent re-entry of the infection. In future stands, the danger of disease can be reduced by ensuring a higher percentage of disease-resistant species. Prescribed burning is also an effective method of destroying the infected residual trees. Dwarf mistletoe is particularly damaging to immature stands. The first step in a sanitation program to reduce the disease is to fell old infected trees and infested bordering stands. Then, attention should be paid to young trees. Those most heavily infected should be felled, and, depending on the state of the tree, some can be pruned. It would be perhaps most economical 
to introduce a sanitation program at the time of juvenile spacing. The key to success is the proper training of spacing crew members in detection of dwarf mistletoe. If the presence of the disease is disregarded and infected trees are left, disease incidents will become greater. Infected residuals, like these, must be removed, and one or two retreatments at three-year intervals are generally necessary to achieve successful results. Given proper control during the first rotation, dwarf mistletoe should not become a serious problem in subsequent rotations. Preventative measures applied at the right time and proper forest management techniques can help reduce growth losses due to dwarf mistletoe in the forests of British Columbia.